Years 9 through 13, part 2. Back in time when my dad was around, we socialized with a friend of his by the name of John Hart. John Hart was a history teacher. And through one of those strange quickenings the universe throws at you, he turned out to be my history teacher in 7th grade. The two of us knew who we were, but he never mentioned anything, and I never mentioned anything. Once that year in my life was done, and going back, I had different schools from grade 6, grade 7, grade 8, grade 9, and grade 10. Five years, five different schools. Small wonder that I ended up being a very weird adult. Anyway, there was an assignment to create a fictitious nation. Consider the economics, the layout, the political system, the GDP, the topography. And I spent a weekend paper mache creating a topographical map of my very elaborate island nation. I was a shy, bright kid in seventh grade. Too shy to go up to him and say, hey, you know, but I figured I could impress him by giving him the most elaborate island nation I could summon. So this was a very elaborate map. Topography, rays, I put a lot of work into it. I created a veritable dossier on this island nation. Perhaps this was the beginnings of a certain writer many years later. Mr. Hart, a.k.a. John Hart, actually introduced me to James Burke. He showed connections in the classroom. I couldn't get enough of it. Years before, when they had put me into the gifted and talented program, I thought it was a scam. I thought that I didn't have the brains to really be any kind of intellectual. What I did have was a febrile imagination and a great work ethic. But James Burke demonstrated that intellectualism could be entertaining, setting off a bright flashball for me in later years. You may have noticed a certain kind of mix with the TikToks that I put out here, right? A strange coincidence, I would in fact meet James Burke when I was 15 in Sacramento, but that's another story. The other thing I remember about being in the seventh grade was challenging an English teacher. See, I was reading a lot of Stephen King in my youth. Back in 1987 or thereabouts, Stephen King was considered scum. Science fiction, horror, and fantasy writers were considered scum. I once spent 20 minutes gallantly defending my man, Stephen King, in the classroom against my seventh grade English teacher. Declared him absolutely mediocre. I would rattle off examples of similes, metaphors, in Skeleton Crew, that amazing short story collection. I remarked on Stephen King's skill at characterization. This was never enough for the snobby English teacher, and he was one of many I would face in my youth. The beginnings of an anti-authoritarian streak were burgeoning within me, despite the fact that I was also very shy. Seventh grade was also the first time I heard the Beastie Boys as License to Ill. I cannot tell you how cool that fucking album was. I'd heard nothing like this. A few years later, I would fall down the punk rock rabbit hole. All this was happening as the second husband that my mother had married was very abusive, once throwing me out of the house. In the seventh grade, I recall one terrible evening in which I was evicted from the house, and I slept in a fucking parking garage that night. And because I was dealing with all the trauma that I had grown up with, there was a six-month period in which I was confined to my bedroom. I was only let out to go to school and also to go to the library. I was painfully shy. I recall befriending some regulars at the library, some other kids who thought I was funny for some reason, even though I was shy as fuck. And they said that I should go up to these two girls and talk to them, but I just couldn't do it. Because again, I was confined to my fucking bedroom. Yeah, we're getting real here, aren't we? The only thing I had for company were books and newspapers. I should point out that I read newspapers at a very early age. I was fascinated by politics and serial killers. And if you're thinking that I was some kind of Columbine type in training, no, no, no. I was fascinated by serial killers because I couldn't understand why they would do that. 12, 13, I'm reading about the son of Sam. I'm reading about Jack the Ripper. Perhaps because I grew up in a monstrous and abusive household. The other big guy who saved me was Berkeley Breath. Bloom County. I collected newspapers from neighbors. Clipped out cartoon strip. He studied them meticulously, wanting to know why these things were so funny. When I was let out of my bedroom, I got some pocket money by going around the neighborhood with some homemade stencils and some spray paint, painting curb numbers, using this money to buy the latest edition of Mad Magazine. I even bought one issue of National Lampoon. I was shocked that I can get away with it because it was like by Playboy and Penthouse comedy. I had not yet discovered Monty Python. That would come later. But this was the beginning. The surreal qualities of Mad, Cracked, and National Lampoon. And Bloom County. If I could see the funny side of every tragedy that I faced, well, this was a survival mechanism for me. Tom Suzuki. I'll have to talk about him. 
He was a therapist who knew damn well what was going on with me. You see, I would attend group therapy and individual therapy. And in group therapy, I would make jokes. And all the kids would start to laugh. And I would make myself the butt of the joke. And the kids loved that, and they loved me. Comedy, the way that a shy kid turns into a people pleaser. The way that an abused kid turns into, well, someone who was a little bit more than that. Someone who could tell stories. And I haven't even mentioned one particular moment, which I should. I was about eight or nine, I think. And I was invited to go on stage at the Santa Clara County Fair. And I delivered a weather report in front of a massive audience. And I improvised this weather report. I said that dogs would rain down from the sky. I said that every part of San Jose would be flooded. And Everyone loved it. I had adults coming up to me saying, oh my God, this kid is amazing. He's hilarious. That was my first big audience. And I was totally confused because I was completely winging it. This was Channel 11 in San Jose. And the guy who was on stage asked me who my favorite weatherman was. And of course, I named a weatherman Joel Bartlett from Channel 5 just to fuck with them. A smart motherfucking kid, huh? <laughs> Jokes. That's what helped save me. It continues to save me. Jokes, entertainment, that was the way in for me to understand this weird intellectual world. But I was still very shy about this massive intellectual world. I mean, when you grow up white trash, you just don't think that you're going to be anything. Even with all the adults speaking in soft voices about what a brilliant kid I was. But I didn't feel brilliant because I would come home and I'd get the shit beaten out of me. The second man my mother married. That son of a bitch. And that motherfucker's son turned out to be a criminal and a fucking rapist. I'm not making this up, man. And thinking about this, it's just kind of astonishing all the fucking shit that I went through. But I am here right now telling you this story, and I haven't even gotten into my teenage years or my 20s or my 30s. I mean, Jesus Christ, what I do now is a fucking miracle. <laughs>